oh, we'll be we will be recording this call. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. This is our um, Peace Alliance uh, Na National Department of Peace Building campaign call that we have on the third Wednesday of every month. So we welcome you to the call. Um, we want you to keep checking the um, chat for any information or links. We'll put in some links about the uh, Department of Peace Building and Gamut and some other things as we go along. Um, my name is Nancy Merritt and I'm part of the um, Department of Peace Building campaign and also part of the Global Alliance for Ministries and Infrastructures for Peace. Um, so as I'm looking around at the uh, at the screen, I'm seeing folks from the uh, Peace Alliance community and the Global Alliance community, and am, am so happy to be able to connect all of us together. Um, our topic is peace education and international perspective, and uh, Yelena Popovic is on our call, I think. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw Yelena, um, who is our peace te uh, practicing peace in schools uh, lead for the Peace Alliance. So I'm really glad you're here also, Yelena, to, um, to chime in on the discussion about this. So thank you for being here. Um, we'll introduce our guests in a minute, but I'll repeat just one more time for those who are just getting on. Uh, please put in the chat your name, your country, and what you think of a sentence, uh, what you think of when you hear the words peace education. Um, so peace education is a, is a really broad topic. There's a quote by um, a former American president uh, who is also a five star general and the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower said, information and education are powerful forces in support of peace. Just as war begins in the minds of men, so does peace. On our call today, we'll explore what peace education is and why it is so important. Um, and then, uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of the agenda. We'll do a connection in a minute, a very super short update on the Department of Peacebuilding Advocacy. Then um, Kendra will introduce our guests and um, we'll have presentations by each of them. And then we'll go into a discussion section and uh, that'll be a time when everybody can uh, contribute or ask questions. So. Thank you for that. Um, it's a tradition on our Department of Peace Building calls to begin with a connection exercise. So I'm introducing Kendra Mon, who is also a uh, co-conspirator um, on Department <laughs> of Peace Building actions, and uh, also a board member of the Global oh. Alliance for Ministries and Infrastructures for Peace and a good friend. And um, Kendra, would you lead us in a connection exercise? So I invite you to join me as we do a short meditation. If, if you like to close your eyes, I, I do. And just take slow, deep breaths. And imagining that your breath is going in through your heart and when you exhale, imagining the breath going out from your heart. Imagine that you have within your heart magic seeds, rainbow colored seeds that you are born with. And when you breathe in, you nourish those seeds. And when you breathe out, you send those seeds out into the world.
seeds of love, seeds of compassion, seeds of peace. And they reach all around the world to you and you and you and me. And we connect through that, those seeds and we connect through our hearts and we will continue that into our call today. We, that connection. Thank you. And back to you, Nancy. Thank you, Kendra. Um, so we traditionally do a little bit longer report, but I'm going to keep it very short so we can get to the topic of education, peace education, um, which is very much a part of the Department of Peace Building um, campaign and the Peace Alliance. Um, we have a bill in Congress, a calling for a cabinet level Department of Peace Building, and it includes um, it includes peace education and training. And um, part of part of what we do is trying to get members of Congress to co-sponsor the bill that we have in Congress. We currently have thirty three co-sponsors. Uh, we were just in Washington, D.C. for advocacy days and went to the Hill and visited about 130 or so congressional offices and had meetings and uh, spread the word and planted seeds for that and got a couple of new co-sponsors on as a result of that. Um, we'll also be going back in September and um, I think I think the quickest way is maybe Karen, you could put the link for the Department of Peace Building web page. Uh, there's a registration form that either is or will be up there soon um, for our uh, advocacy days in the fall, which will be September 17th to 20th. And uh, we would love for as many of you as possible to join join that either in person or by Zoom calls or by um, amplifying what we're doing and we'll provide you a list of Congress people to, um, to, to connect with. So um, that's the really quick view of what's happening in the, in the campaign. Um, I wanted to say, as you can see from the chat, um, peace education has many dimensions and um, in our announcement for this call, uh, Kofi Annan said that education is quite simply peace building by another name. Um, so to me, that's why this call and why this topic, because peace education is um, core to all of us being our best selves. And uh, we're always learning from each other and teaching each other. So. Um, that's very important. As I mentioned in the Department of Peace Building Bill, there's a section for peace education, uh, calling for peace education at school levels and the community and uh, both domestically and internationally. And it includes things like anti-harassment, anti-bullying, uh, social, emotional learning, mindfulness, compassion, restorative practices, um, and things like that. And it also calls for studying um, the US civil rights movement and human, uh, human and rights and liberties movements and um, all kinds of other things honoring our diverse cultures in our country and in the world. And um, Yelena, maybe we'll talk a bit uh, in a bit about peace, uh, our peace alliance. Um, cornerstone of practicing peace in schools, which encompasses a lot of the things that I just mentioned. And um, uh, I'm happy to weave all of that in. So I'm really looking forward to learning more from our friends in the Gamut community. And um, 
I'm going to turn it over to Kendra to say a little bit about Gamut and uh, to introduce our guest speakers. Thank you. Nancy and I have served for something like two years with each of our guests, and they are three untiring peace advocates, both on the board of the Global Alliance of Ministries and Infrastructures for Peace. And we know each of them as incredibly able and willing to sow seeds of peace in our meetings and in the world. Alicia Cabazudo is a professor, researcher, and trainer on the fields of peace, citizenship, and human rights education. She is a professor of emeritus at the School of Education, University of Rosario, Argentina, and at the UNESCO Chair on Culture of Peace and Human Rights at the National University of Buenos Aires, Aires Iris, Argentina. Also, Alicia is a founding member of the Global Campaign for Peace Education, and a member of the International Association of Peace Educators, the Latin American Commission on Peace Research, and International Peace Research Association, and an inter International Association of Educating Cities, and the Latin American Network on Human Rights Education. Um, I'm going on to Paul Maylet, who is a retired military officer who served in the Canadian military for 33 years, spent four years yep. at, as Director of Defense Essex in the Canadian Department of National Defense, holds a peace professional accreditation from the Civilian Peace Service Canada. Paul currently works in the field of peace services, organizational ethics, and controlling corruption measures. This has involved work for numer numerous Canadian federal government departments, Aboriginal communities, and international products projects in developing countries. Evelyn Voigt was born a prisoner of war and alternated between running free on an isolated Amer African farm and Dickensian style boarding schools. From the extremes emerged a fascination with unity and diversity reflected in her choice of citizenship, Canadian and profession, international development and retirement Peace building. She is a founding member, member of the Civilian Peace Service Canada, an NGO that has pioneered and pilot, piloted the first values and competency based assessment methodology for accrediting peace professionals. Back to you, Nancy. We have wonderful guests. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, um, so each of our guests will speak for about 10 minutes and um, then we'll move on to the section of, of where we'll have discussion and questions. And um, I'll call on Alicia first to talk about building a culture of peace through peace education. Then Paul will talk about peace art architecture and Evelyn will talk about peace professionalism. So I will turn it over to you, Alicia, and thank you for being on the call. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you to you, to you all to be here today. My colleagues from GAMIP, my colleagues from the Peace Alliance and the people here. Well, um, I have been invited to talk a little bit, 10 minutes, short time, for trying to understand the importance of uh, peace education, how it is developing today. Uh, peace education is a huge umbrella that very many times people ask me, well, all the good things are inside or under this umbrella? Well, almost, I said, as peace education means 
actions means uh, fundamental frameworks, means values, and means also uh, projects and programs on the field. So for very many years, from the very start of the field, I would say probably in the 60s, as a systematic way to develop peace education that was started like this um, aspect, from this aspect by Betty Rudin in the United States, very much influenced by the studies of Shohan Kaltung, which was her friend. So the, the, the field comes to be a particular part of education. So when we started working it in Latin America, I'm Latin American, we very much based our studies in the studies of Betty Redden from the United States, which was not usual to use a North American as a resource for us, particularly in the South South, like Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay, it's more usual in Central America or even in Colombia. But the, we found that there we have the framework of what we try to do. This education must be something that has to be related to values, to actions, to feelings, to emotions, and also to build knowledge on what is. And what is that? And what are the main themes that we have to consider? We have changed during the years, but there are basic concepts that we developed on that time that was the start of peace education, almost the 70s in the South South. And uh, we keep on that till now. And that was the concepts of empathy and solidarity and cooperation and respect for others and human rights and also citizenship and environment and human security. That was security in the start, but now human security, participation and democracy. So peace education is related. That is very important to remember to values, but also to principles that we tried to clarify and also to actions that we have to propose to our students, to our colleagues and to the community. So considering that, and this field inside the, inside the education, we started to work on how we can develop it in the education system. Not only in formal education that you meet attached to the institutions, primary, secondary, university institutions, but also how to attach and to develop peace education out of that institution, which we call in pedagogy non-formal education. How we can create peace education scenarios in the streets, in the beaches, in the cultural centers, in the, in the gardens, everywhere. And so because of that, we have to start to think the framework of the theory. And so I will ask Karen, please, to show the first slide with the, 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 the second one, yes, after the title. That then you see uh, how we try to fix uh, these issues together. Please, the next one, Karen. Here we have, can you make it uh, bigger, please? Here you have three of the main components that we develop when we work on peace pedagogy, trying to explain what is peace education. We have first, bigger, please, you can make it. Yeah, please. Um, first, you have to try to, to analyze the contextual conditions where the peace education have to develop. And so that contextual conditions are basic. Perhaps 
for you it's for granted. No, it is not. Many, many times working in teachers training, as they do in Colombia or in any country in Latin America, even in Europe, I found that the teachers go directly to the content. Look at the left. But it doesn't, uh, how can I say, makes the relationship in between the contextual conditions that in a word dictates you the contents. So first of all, in our field, we have to know very well where are we going to teach or to develop a program with who, what moment, why, and what are the needs. And this make a kind of picture of the scenario where you're going to develop your peace education strategy. And I always observe to my students, particularly teachers or educators, let's see, so non-formal as well, how in the way that they made it, that study of the contextual condition, then you can best select the contents. So they are absolutely related. So first the description where you are trying to work in peace education. Then what are the contents that they are needed in that place? We're going to see in the next ones how we, we make this. So no, no, please, the, the before, before Karen, keep there, keep in the, in the other one. So that relation that relation between the contextual conditions and the content gives me also the keys for the methodology. So studying the where, the, the, the where, the with who, the when, I mean the spaces, then you go to decide what are you going to develop as peace educator, and then you decide what methodology are you going to use there? So this relationship is kind of skeleton that we use in peace education is absolutely basic in our field. After you have started with that I need, study I need, in the context. I, I with, need, you asked yeah. me to let you know when you had two minutes left. Yeah, please Karen keep on the other one. Please keep on the other one. Don't mix the, the, the presentations. Thank you. So when we are very ready to know uh, what is the contextual condition, what are the contents that we are going to decide, what are the methodologies, we go then to the principles. Please put the slide of the principles, Karen that we have the four principles after this, please. That's the next one. Yes, keep here, please, right? So then we started with this. The four principles that we work in peace education is first the idea of holism, that all the issues all the principles have to be related between them. We don't isolate the themes, but we have to approach them all together at the same time. I'm going to give you examples. Also, with the holism, we know that we have to create or to form values in the peace education. So it's part of our um, search and of our approach and our objective to try to do this. Then absolutely to use the dialogue as the main methodology in order to develop all the relationship in between the students and in between the instructor and the students. And last but not least, the developing of critical thinking is basic in order to develop a critical peace education field. So integration of the concepts or the, let's say, of the contents, the formation of values, the use of dialogue as the main methodology and the critical thinking as a way to shape our work 
when approaching the main themes is a way to develop this. The next one, please. I think we're, About, out, of, uh, we're yeah. out of time, but I think we can catch up in, in later discussion. Is that okay with you, Alicia? Yeah, I can make it a longer, a little bit explanation after this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so now we'll go to Paul. If you would, if you would um, talk, talk a little bit with us, Paul, about peace architecture. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kendra and Nancy, uh, two good friends that I admire and worked with for a while. Um, what I would like to do is, uh, at this point, what I've been asked to do really is, uh, given the framework uh, that was preceded, is to talk about specifically what, what we can actually uh, cover in peace education, uh, uh, very, very much at a highly practical level. Um, in other words, when one goes into a community or at a national level or uh, trying to do Things in the in the in the um, uh, in the self. Uh, what are the basics? And let's see if I can make this into a uh, into a thing. Okay. Oops, don't want that. There's only a few actually more of the, the slides here. So uh, basically, the architecture speaks about a variety of things. Uh, it starts at the global level. Uh, goes to the level of the nation, uh, goes to the level of the community, and comes back down to the level of the self. And what we want to do, or what we want to try to do with such an architecture, is to find very, very practical ways of, of uh, approaching this, uh, so that we're going to be able to teach uh, somebody with probably maybe very low levels of education, uh, right down at the community or, or village level. Uh, working internationally, uh, we work at all sorts of all sorts of levels, and um, uh, actually, by looking at the chat there, I think uh, there's a lot of people here who do work in peace education, and can probably uh, teach me some things. But uh, basically, at the global level, um, we have the culture of peace uh, that is anchored in UN Resolution 53 um, to 43, uh, which talks about what it is and and. Basically, this peace architecture is in support of implementing that. So we want to implement this culture of peace re resolution. We have a very strong, strong uh, uh, resolution that we can talk to a government with uh, that's going to justify uh, peace education practices in your, in your country or community. Then below the culture of peace, we have the infrastructures of peace uh, concept. Uh, below that, the ministries of peace uh, concept. And then below all of that would be some framework uh, with regards to peace education. So that, that is the kind of the, the goal that we're, that we're looking at. Now, I realize this might be a little bit of a busy slide, but starting this is what could we teach at the level of the citizen? And basically, uh, we're talking about creating in some sense uh, a menu of practical tools, a toolbox almost, uh, that one can select from. One doesn't have to do all of these things or do any of them. Uh, one can approach peace education in many ways, but we find that we're getting into, into various communities that it's the praxis, the highly practical things that come to, come to mind. So basically uh, the idea of building peace within, strengthening the self as a precursor to engaging be, between peace with uh, between, in other words, engaging others. So we're saying that there has to be a foundation, as Alicia said, of values uh, and various things uh, within the self so that one can approach the, um, uh, the task of engaging others. So strengthening the self may have a very, very important component about purpose and meaning and all the dialogue and structures that, that are around that. And certainly well-being and resiliency. Uh, one cannot enter the, the peace building field or peace practitioner field uh, without some sort of uh, um, strength of the self sort of thing. How do I handle trauma and suffering when it occurs? So engaging peace between a very a foundation of, of shared peace values, human rights, and probably the most important, important one is some skills with regards to uh, nonviolent and peace-centered communication. 
and integrity-based decision-making. How do I make decisions? Um, how do I speak uh, to each other and uh, set the example in some ways and take advantage of teaching moments? So facing wrongdoing, basic conflict resolution, all the way down to uh, some sort of capacity for risk management, which is going to be some kind of awareness uh, with regards to these things. Uh, what indicators are, what can we do about it, what can we do in a preventative uh, sort of sense, and have some discussion and really tailor everything to what the, the uh, education context and needs are of the uh, people once working with. So at the level of the peace practitioner, uh, we are going from the self to the community. And uh, what can we talk about in terms of training peace practitioners and what what kind of skill sets and knowledge uh, should they have in, in addition to sort of pedagogy skills? Uh, certainly, you know, talking about community centers for peace, what's possible, what, what are action plans like? Um, there's a nice construct, an international construct on communities of compassion uh, that are useful. So there is the idea that when peace practitioner goes into a community, that there is some infrastructure or some structure that, that, he, can, that he can put to, uh, to the community or the leadership. And then whatever outreach that he can do, he or she can do. So community outreach, of course, can be providing education or dialogue, advice to governance, mentoring, intergenerational connections, which is extremely important, uh, ethics uh, programs, awareness, and it resonates back to uh, the self here, conflict uh, resolution, closure, reconciliation, and nonviolent social action. And, and what it means when one encounters con uh, conflict in terms of uh, peace building in, in the preventative sense, in conflict, peacemaking during conflict, and peacekeeping in post-conflict situations. Okay. Uh, then we can get at the at the national level, which we would we would term in loosely as uh, the peace professional level. And similarly, what kind of infrastructure can they can they build at a national level? Uh, talking about peace professional standards, for example. Uh, legislative frameworks like we're working on in the Columbia project, uh, working there, ministries of peace, national peace centers, uh, national or region, regional action plans. What does that mean and how do we tailor that to our, to our um, uh, situations, community and building community peace centers? And then there are all sorts of programs that, that, that they can run in terms of creating a, a um, community of peace professionals, trainers, practitioners, citizens, uh, getting education into the national school systems, mentoring, training, uh, and most importantly at the national level to be able to monitor peace issues, advisory and research to government, uh, becoming part of the government decision making and policy uh, uh, processes, uh, and having a seat at the table that it's least as, as equal to, uh, for example, the Department of Defense. So national ethics disclosure reprisal protection programs, uh, which we put into governments uh, and participation in international and domestic peace operations. So that's basically the three the three levels, um, and we have a course designed ar around all of this. And uh, on the first that's course, two minutes. Can, two minutes. Thank you. So at the first course, the peace building applications that we talked about were brought up by the, the students and the people in the course. And we discussed gender equality, racism, extremism. Uh, they had a war and, and armed conflict problem, uh, violence and crime, and they had a religious conflict problem and military police. So that's basically it, uh, the universal things. The cultural peace and UN resolution, I just wanted to highlight that it has eight action areas education, human rights, women, tolerance, solidarity, international peace and security that one can leverage when one is building up ap applications. And so I would say that there are five of these that are really core, uh, the peacemaker and building the skills in which they have a presence in conflict and they're impartial, they bring a bias to values of nonviolence and they have communication skills, uh, particularly with nonviolent communication. Um, oops, what have I lost here? Uh, purpose and meaning, uh, which is uh, very, very important with intergenerational connections and how we prepare children in mimetic structures, how youth find a way, how adults live their purpose, and how elders pass it on back to children and youth. So not only do individuals have a role in their, in their uh, purpose and meaning, but the community also has a role.
So very quickly, this is resiliency, uh, nonviolent communication about facts, feelings, needs, comment, uh, ethical decision-making, balancing rules, consequences, humanitarian considerations, values, and lastly, uh, basically, and one of the basic comments would be, as Gandhi said, my life is my message, and uh, that's about the, uh, is something that one can do, uh, no matter how helpless or powerless they feel in, in, in some situations. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Evelyn, would you um, go ahead and tell us um, a little bit more about um, peace professionalism? Yes, certainly. Um, I will just share screen. I share screen. Oops, Gordon, can you help me with this? My hand is so. I have I have palsy in my hand, so it's an issue to. Where's your presentation? Can you press Can you press share for me, please? Sorry about that. Share. And the presentation is here. Press, click on that. On where? The brown part. Click. Okay. And now. And now. Slideshow? Yes, please. Slideshow and start from the beginning. Yes. There we, go. there we are. Thank you very much. Whoops, I've gone too far. Gordon, sorry. Can you stay here? And when I say click, can you go back to the beginning, please? <laughs> it's good to have helpers, right? Related to my hands. I I inherited my father's hands with the palsy. Um, so maybe go to the next slide. Um, Paul has already mentioned this, but I'll begin by saying that the other day I cut my finger, so I grabbed a band-aid because I don't need to be a doctor to practice first aid. The same is true in, in peace. Now, many years ago, I broke my neck in a car accident in the African bush, right next to a sign that said, elephants have right of way. Oh. I digress. <laughs> the main point is that with a broken neck, I needed a medical professional. And as Alicia has <coughs> said, and as Paul has spoken before, uh, has mentioned before, the same applies in the peace field. Everybody can be a citizen of peace. Many will also choose to practice peace informally. And some will choose peace building as a profession. So I'm going to focus today on peace building as a profession. And the first, actually, if you could go back, the first um, point I'd like to make is or answer is what is a peace professional? And for that, I'd like you to imagine a situation in northern Uganda where a rebel leader is terrorizing the community. Imagine yourself as a parent and you don't know from one minute to the next whether your little boy will be kidnapped and turned into a child soldier or whether your daughter will be kidnapped. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And turned into a wife for the soldiers. And one day your worst fears are confirmed. Your daughter is kidnapped, another hundred girls, and you get together with frantic parents to decide what to do. You have heard that the, the army goes in to try and capture Kony many times, guns blazing, but in the deep bush, it has very little effect and too many children die. So you decide to try something new and you call in a peace professional. Now, Ben Hoffman has many years of experience at the highest level. He negotiated the first Sudan peace agreement for president, on behalf of President Carter. He has advised governments, he has monitored elections, but he is also an extraordinarily empathetic individual and he has much experience in, in um, negotiation, mediation at the personal level. So Ben does what Ben usually does under these circumstances. He writes a letter to be opened by his wife if he doesn't return, and he goes into the jungle. All 100 girls are returned and not a single shot is fired. 
but you don't have to be an international expert to be a feast professional. So I'll take you to another situation, which is where a young man, while driving drunk, kills a pregnant woman. The young man is suicidal. The father of the unborn child, the widower, is very angry and threatening violence against the family of the young man. So Pat has called in. Now Pat has also had knowledge and experience in mediation and, and also restorative justice. It takes time, but soon both the young man, neither the young man nor the bereaved father and husband are threatening violence to themselves or others. So what do Pat and Ben have in common? Next slide, please. Yes, what they have in common is, and Alicia will and Paul will recognize the parallels between what they have said. What they have in common is values, expertise, experience, and knowledge. Now imagine thousands of Bens and Pats working together under a priest profession. Next one, please. So what, what would a peace profession look like? Alicia spoke about the development of the, of the profession of peace educator. The peace field at this point is not yet under an umbrella of peace profession, but if it were, you would have common standards, quality control, ethics, and all of them contributing to peace. So who would benefit from a peace profession? Everybody, citizens better protected, peace workers formally recognized and building peace better, employers find people, youth have a path to, to peace professionalism. And um, so, sorry, can you go back one please? Um, so the question is, thank you. The question is, now that you've said it's important to have a peace profession, how do you define a competency model for peace professionalism? Like the peace education folks, the people looking for a competency model for peace professionalism began with Johann Gautung in terms of his definition of a peace professional as somebody who works from the head and the heart. And also Lederach under action who says you also need to work with your hands and your feet. So the outcome of that would be effective peace building. But what we are looking for is effective peace professionals. And so we said, what does head, heart, hands and feet mean? If you are trying to assess a peace professional and we came up with a peace professional, puts it, does their work using core values which are the motives that underlie your behavior and key competencies, which are the skills that allow you to put your, your values into practice for peace building. Then we said, okay, so how do you begin to define the heart of a peace professional for an, for an assessment, for a practical assessment? And we came up, through consultation um, around the world with practitioners and academics with eight umbrella core values, empathy, humility, and 10 key competencies, including communication, teamwork, very important, strategic thinking, and so on. The next issue was, well, now that you've identified those, how do you measure them? And like the peace field and like, sorry, like education and every, any other field, it's relatively easy to assess knowledge and skills. And in the peace field, mediators and facilitators have been assessed and certified for many years. What's more difficult to assess are the motives, the traits, and the self-concept. Two minutes. Um, so if we take, unfortunately, it's hidden behind, but if you can see, Values assessments will be looking for the desire for social justice and peace for all. So what you're assessing uh, for competency 
for a peace professional is does the individual have the desire, the motivation for social justice and peace for all? Because if you have no desire for peace for all, it doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter how many people you've spoken to, you're not going to be very effective. The same, uh, the same applies to integrity and so on. So again, for the peace professional assessment, one would be looking for the desire for social justice and peace for all. And now you go to the next slide. Um, and this is the competency model for peace education. So now I'm contrasting and comparing peace education and the assessment. So you saw the earlier slide where we had Johan Galtung with the head and the heart. And I thank the Latin Americans for the concept of senti pensante, and also for the giving birth to the concept that in order to teach, you cannot just look at the cognitive, you can't reach a student just through the brain, you also need to reach them through their emotions. So again, there's the parallel with the core values, but in the case of education, you are importing, imparting knowledge towards them. For the hands and the feet in education is a beautiful word called praxis, which is that you cannot separate action and learning. And the outcome for the peace educator is to prepare whoever is they are working with for life, for life experience. And for those who choose peace as a profession, you are in the in the universe at the university level, you are preparing them to go into life, gain the experience so they can be assessed and accredited as peace professionals. Again, in the peace education field, easy to teach the knowledge and skills, much more difficult to impart the self-learning towards the values, but fundamental. How does this all fit together in real life? Can, can we postpone this yes, to the discussion? You. So what we have said is, and what peace educators are saying, everybody is saying is you begin in kindergarten, and for those that begin to take an interest, particularly in peace, you can have peace badges, you eventually move to corps at university level. And for those that are looking for peace as a profession, we would like that the peace educators at that level should begin to introduce the students to the core values and key competencies of a peace professional. So if I go to the next slide, please. Um, then I, I think we need to wrap up. That's right. This is my last slide. I'm wrapping up to say okay. my vision okay. for the world, as I've said, is that core values and key competencies are routinely integrated into peace and conflict studies, and that graduates use their hearts, their minds, their hands, and their feet to help create a global culture of peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank all three of you for giving us a flavor. I know we barely got started. Um, uh, Kendra, were you going to do a little summary of the sort of the key points that they yes, uh, touched but, on? But but I'm just overwhelmed. I really am. <laughs> I, I I learned so much from this discussion already, and. Um, I just want to say, first of all, everybody mentioned values. Everybody mentioned values. And, uh, and uh, about critical thinking and starting with the self and going out uh, into community or international or conflict resolution just between two people. And we got so much information about uh, the toolbox that uh, Paul mentioned and um, that, that you tailor the training to the needs of the people 
and uh, and from Evelyn, we had so many illustrations of about how, as peace professionals, we can be a peace citizen. Every one of us can be a peace citizen. Mm -hmm. Peace professional, then there would be core values, competencies, and how to assess them and uh, standards. And I, 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 that's a poor job of summarizing what each of you said. And I so appreciate um, your willingness to share so much in a short time and to be cut off. I mean, <laughs> that's very difficult for me. In a very peaceful way. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't feel peaceful. Oh. And and I now I think that people can offer some additional comments to their presentation, right? Yeah, why don't you maybe each of you take just a minute or two and then I want to bring Yelena into the discussion too. So uh, maybe um well maybe Alicia, why don't you go ahead and uh, do another minute or two and then we'll we'll go on. Does that sound thank okay? You. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I want to highlight the importance of teachers training in peace education. We have not uh, particularly talked about that besides the peace professionalism that it is an issue and expertise of our good friend Evelyn. But the need to introduce peace education in a curricular design of teachers training is a must today. And very many times you, you don't find it in the projects or programs at national level. You find, for example, recommendations to work on peace, to recommendations on work on conflict resolution or mediation in the school, in the classrooms, in the universities. But it is not true that we have this kind of training, a systematic one, in order to develop that in the countries today, not only in Latin America, but everywhere. So to highlight the issue that it, we need a particularly training, uh, how can I say, bill related to that. And even Colombia, that is a country that has a law the law 1732, that in a way it is compulsory to all schools to have that culture of peace chair, really it doesn't happen. And in, in any case, if it happens, the teachers are not trained for that. So they don't know very clearly what to do, or they do something like a video and then a discussion and that's it in all the year or a kind of poetry, then they read a poem about solidarity, and then that's it. So um, we have to understand, and this is the last um, thing that I'm going to say, that peace education, you have to be um, alphabetized by that. You have to learn peace education as you learn how to read and to, to write. And that is why it is very important what Evelyn said that at all the levels we need it, but also we need people trained for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul and Evelyn, do you mind if I interject uh, Yelena right now and then come back to you too? Absolutely not. I yeah. mean, yeah, please. Go ahead. <laughs> please. The reason, the reason, so I want to introduce you all to Yelena, and um, she's our P, uh, practicing peace and schools um, lead in the Peace Alliance, and she's a school psychologist, and um, one of the things she does is assist schools in um, their efforts of skillful, integrated, and sustainable school-wide implementation of mindfulness and peace education practices. And um, so I would love, Yelena, for you to add any comments um, from your experience of what you're hearing and uh, for your, from your own work. Thank you, Nancy. Glad to be here with you all. Um, so lovely to be in the community. 
at um you know it's like nine o'clock where i am nine <laughs> o'clock at night and to know that there are so many people uh, out there caring about this stuff this late um it's it's really touching um yeah i want to kind of just emphasize this need for um teaching our educators how to be peace educators um and needing uh, teachers to teach peace and really working on that because you know one of the things that um, we are talking about we are actually now asking teachers to do a lot of things and to be a lot of things and they are not necessarily ready to be all of that um, they don't have training um, to be all of that um, and quite frankly I I'm on the ground in schools. I work as a um, mindfulness director in a preschool right now, and I teach, uh, teach peace of mind. That's uh, a curriculum that I teach, which is um, a curriculum that integrates mindfulness, social emotional learning, and conflict resolution. So I work with um, three to five year olds and actually teach them those skills and practice. I'm mostly practicing that skills with them and modeling. And what I see um, is that it's really hard um, for us to talk about peace education if we don't start with what Paul talked about, peace within. Um, because without a peace within, there is no peace between. Um, and I see that. I see that our educators are really struggling they're really at uh, um, the, the level of stress that they're experiencing, the level of, um, you know, them leaving a profession for so many reasons, uh, one of them being feeling really not safe in schools. Um, you know, in, in United States, we have, um, you know, mm. shooter drills, um, you know, and teachers are feeling uh, scared for their lives. So, you know, so we are really um, far out um, and teaching what does it mean to be a peace educator? What does it mean to, what does it mean to be a peace practitioner? Um, and um, so that's, those are some of my things. I, I really um, believe, you know, we can get there. But it is something that I see day in and day out. Uh, we are not investing. Our, our country is not investing in this. Um, no. And that's not where our money goes. This is not where our time is going. And we are, on the contrary, I live in South Carolina. We are actually banning books. We are actually, uh, you know, putting stop on social emotional learning. We are actually saying empathy is not what we need to practice in schools. So, you know, so it's, we as, as you know, practitioners are peace, it's, um, it's really, it's really hard also to practice peace too, when knowing and being in that, you know, peace between when all of this is happening around us and not saying, you know, I see teachers that just said, please don't, don't give me anything more. I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't teach kids to breathe. I can't breathe myself. So, um, you know, so that's where we are at. And I'm, I'm very real with you because I'm, you know, this is what my life is. I, I come in, um, you know, work in schools and this is what I hear. And we pay early childhood teachers $15 an hour. That's, that's a reality. Oh, thank you, Yelena. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a sorry reflection on our culture. Um, all the things that you're saying and that we don't value our children and our teachers and peace. Um, well, Paul and Evelyn, maybe you want to make another comment or two and then we will open it up for other people to um, give their questions or comments. Okay. Um, yes, thank you, Jelena. Um, a lot of things that you have said resonate absolutely for sure. Um, 
I remember one elder telling me, you know, we've got to learn to learn what we already know in, in a lot of sense, uh, because we are going down some very, very difficult ways. I guess if I was going to add one thing was the concept of mimetic structures, uh, which you may be familiar with. Uh, mimetic structures is says that we mimic, comes from the word mimic, uh, the values and belief and cultures that are, that's around us um, in order to survive or belong. So we, I think one of the things that we, we try to say is, okay, let's talk about this mimetic structure you have around children, for example, and what values and, and beliefs and whatnot are being passed on from generation to generation. And if we have uh, mimetic structures of blessing, uh, we're in a good way. If we have mimetic structures of violence, um, this, this is being passed on. And then the question uh, emerges as to how do we break the, the cycles of mimetic structures of violence, for example. And the first, the first step, of course, is you know just shine a light on it to start with. You know, once people are aware that this mimetic structure is operating either in a community or a family or something like this, something can be done. Uh, we had residential school uh, tragedies in Canada, and people would tell me that they cannot forgive, and we, we, we can empathize with that and say, okay, uh, but let's let's see what we can do about not passing on victimization to the children. Uh, if you don't want your children to smoke, don't smoke in front of them kind of, kind of thing. Uh, the life is the message kind of, uh, of construct. So I would just add that point. Thank you, Paul. Evelyn, did you have something else to add? I guess that what I'd like to add is the reason we, the reason I became passionate about trying to put Dr. Galtung's concept of a peace professional is somebody who works from the head and the heart and put that into practice and, and advocate for peace professionalism is one of the, one of the issues with the word peace and anybody in with peace is that if we don't see ourselves as professionals, other people still see us as do-gooders or people with good hearts, but not as professionals. And if, if they do not see us as professionals, then they're not going to put us into the same category as other professionals that need to be called in when there's a problem. And the people within the peace field understand the extraordinary complexity, I mean, whether it's teaching or whether, whether it's practicing peace, the extraordinary complexity of that. And I do believe that there is, there is a need to raise the profile of peace workers into the concept of they are not just peace workers, they are peace professionals. Yes. Yeah. Is yes. Peace profession teaching peace will be seen as teaching professionals, not as teaching good people yeah. or meaning people. That's that's all I would add. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Evelyn, you want to say something quick and then we'll uh, open it up to others? I mean, Alicia, sorry. <laughs> One of you all. <laughs> I'm always renaming Evelyn, so uh, <laughs> it's Joanna. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Besides the considerations of our friend Paul and Evelyn related to the professionalism and the need of the of the training, I mean, to be prepared for doing this quite, uh, how can I say, complex profession that it is to be a peace educator in formal and informal education. We have to remember another issue in peace education that I want to highlight. That is the issue that we don't have only to build peace. We have to deconstruct violence. So really the movement in education is two waves. From one hand, we have to deconstruct the culture of violence. And now I am using the concept of Dr. David Adams. We have to deconstruct the culture of violence at the same time that we are constructing the culture of peace. So the movement is parallel. You can't 
build or construct directly culture of peace without deconstructing the extraordinary pressure of the violence that it is, how can I say, the king and the queen of our lives everywhere mm -hmm. today, as even Shilena had said, in schools, inside schools, in the streets, between the countries, between the politicians, etc. So to know that we are inside this culture of violence, that this culture of violence, that is why Galton was so wise in order to study the violence and study the conflict. Because if you don't study the violence and conflict, you don't know how to deconstruct it. And that is a step before constructing peace. Mm -hmm. So these two issues have to be, have to be developed also with educators and that is why very many times people ask me why are you talking about conflict and conflict transformation if this is a peace education course because you need to characterize that and the ways to deconstruct in order to build the other one that it is our issue build peace so these two parts i think it is important to consider as well thank you Thank you. Thank you. Alicia. <laughs> um, so does anybody have a question or comment on all these amazing things that are being said? I do. Laura, I see your hand. And how about Laura? And then did you say, Jana, did you say you had a comment too? Yeah. Okay. You want to go Laura and then Jana? We have to unmute you. Um, so, okay, while we're trying to unmute you, let's go to Jana and then we'll come back. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, my only comment was thank you very much for this very rich presentation, all of you, all four of you. Um, I, I had one comment about professionalism and the motivation, the sincere motivation, the integrity, the values are essential for every kind of professional, not just yeah. the peacemakers, for the doctors, for the lawyers, for the social workers, for the government people, for every kind yeah. of profession you can imagine. That's true. For the street cleaners. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jana. Um, Laura, are you unmuted? I don't see you. Uh, okay, how about an order on my screen, Nancy? Yes, um, good evening, everyone. Greetings from Colombia in Latin America. So I'm a university teacher and I work on peace education. So I teach um, the pre-service teachers in language teaching in Colombia, which entails like a very interesting and complex endeavor. And I've had the opportunity to work with the Truth Commission as well and be part of a very important process that is called the work that reconnects that was created by <laughs> Joanna Macy. And then um, this work that reconnects has represented for us as an opportunity in order to start with the self, as some of you were saying today, presenting today is the work of connection to our own selves and the opportunity to evaluate our prejudices and biases that allow us to connect to other people from other different places uh, that do not start necessarily with the labels, right? Because we have had very um, challenging times when we are have like the victimizers, let's say, and the victims sat at the same table. So how do we generate dialogue, but um, even more, how do we heal? How do we reconcile a part of all these violent processes that we have? So I would like to emphasize that, that I do truly believe in these experiential processes and practices before we move into the education of teachers and the training of teachers and even the teacher trainers that, I, that is part of the, the work that I am doing here at the university is talking to the dean of the faculty of education mm -hmm. about the need of training the trainers of teachers first and then do the work with the bachelor students 
in order to uh, really in, in understand what it, this peace pedagogies entail, but uh, starting with these experiential processes. So the word that we connect is a process in which we are in connection with the human uh, mother earth. And then we start with different activities starting to connect to our humanities. And I emphasize starting not from the labels, but from our emotions, our experiences. What is it that are our memories? And from there, we humanize the experience. So a part of my understandings in this peace education has been a pedagogy that I have been shaping with my, my students, inspired in Paulo Freire also, with critical thinking being this mixture be, between thinking, uh, reflection, and action, as Paulo Freire says. And this is the pedagogy of possibilities, where I have different workshops. One of them is under the skin, where we are inviting people to really challenge labels and also to challenge and question our biases, prejudices, and other things. So I just wanted to share those little reflections and just thank you, the three of you, because you leave, leave, leave me thinking about the professionalism of peace education, which I didn't have it clear till this day, plus all the importance of the context, how to understand our context in order for us to really think about peace education and the values and all the elements that Paul, uh, I will take a little longer to understand all the different elements that you presented by the end, because I think that every one of them is so powerful by itself. And we will need, of course, a little bit of more time in order for us to get deep, deeper into those concepts. But thank you all for this beautiful space. I celebrate it, just as Jelena was saying. And Jelena, thank you so much also for the context and the experience. I true, I connect with everything you said and I understand the context you are in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy, for your for your comments and your work both. Um, I would like to go a few minutes longer if we can, um, just because uh, we have some more comments to get in and um, we won't go to maybe, maybe till 6.30 Pacific um, if there are still comments, but I do see some hands, so. Um, Josh Roebuck, how about you from the great city of Oakland, California? Hi. Um, my question is for Alicia. Uh, you, you mentioned the concept of holism, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by that. And, and maybe speak. it seems like it was something the other two presenters talked about as well and was wondering if you could talk about how your concept of holism relates to things that they talked about as well. And thank you all for, for your presentations. So Alicia. Yeah, uh, when we uh, study or analyze uh, Josh and colleagues, the how the education is developed in another field, we see that the, the, there is a kind of division in between concepts, in between themes. So the professors at university level or at secondary primary school, but mainly in the university, which is terrible, by the way, you make a theme and you develop a theme and then you go to another one and then you go to another one and they are like blocks that they are separated. In peace education, when you analyze the situation, it's a pity I have not shown the, the presentation that I have related to it, that it is the micro and the macro, you always have to relate relate in a perspective from global to local, all the situations that you are studying in peace education, even it is inside the classroom, like a kind of fight in between two children or in the, in the playground or a fight between two countries. So the issue that the themes that we have to approach have not to be analyzed as single events, but the events that are connected with roots that we have to study and to know. That is why Galton used, you know, the iceberg model, that you see only the peak of the iceberg, but then you have seven parts of that ice inside the water that you don't see, but it is the roots of what you see on the surface. So the integration of concepts means to relate 
all the issues when you have very many perspectives when you are studying um, a concept or an event in peace education and also to integrate them for the, from a multidisciplinary perspective so not only uh, from the perspective of a political point of view or a social point of view, but try to understand that roots or that event or that concept that you are going to develop in a way that you can see from different views. So the integration Hosh, is done with the other themes that are related to that or the event that you are studying. And also it is integrated because you use very many disciplinaries and not only one methodology or um, approach in order to try to understand that event or that concept. So integration between themes and integration between disciplines. That is what I mean. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Laura, did you still have a question? <laughs> uh, just a comment, I guess. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for your presentations. I thought they were incredible. Um, and to the theme about how do we institutionalize peace education, um, I was really relating to what everybody said because um, I have an undergraduate degree in journalism and a master's degree in communications and communications like peace peace building and peace is like a really big field <laughs> and um you know I went to Boston University and there's a school of communications and there's international communications and interpersonal communications and mm -hmm. advertising and mass media different elements of where you break break communications down but it's a, still a relatively new field I was in that in the 90s and it's still a relatively new field of defining itself. And it takes, you know, a, a special school with academics and people, uh, students coming up and learning and contributing research and helping to, to define what that, what is communications. And so I was just thinking that wouldn't it be great if we could get like an endowment or some kind of major chunk of fun funding and create, you know, an academic school of peace building at a major university and bring all of this great study academics, um, different curriculum and focus together. And then you've got that, a place to contain all of this and work it all out and develop the develop the field into, you know, in 50 years, it can be a much more mature field. So that was, to me is exciting. Thank you, Laura. Um, it... Amina, you've had your hand up for a minute. Yes, hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Alicia, Paul and Evelyn for that wonderful presentation. Um, I personally learned a lot from, from this today and I'm so glad I made time to attend this this event, so thank you. Um, one of the things I just had a comment, basically, uh, one of the common values that um, all three of you mentioned was basically empathy uh, for for basically a peace builder or a peace educator or a professional in, in a strong desire for social justice and peace for all. And that was a piece that resonated the most with me personally. And as someone who grew up uh, grew up in, as most most of the Peace Alliance colleagues of mine know about this, uh, growing up in, in a war zone in Afghanistan, um, peace and, and, and peace building is, is a strong desire within my heart, and it's always been. And so that's uh, truly, regardless of what skills I bring or, or not bring, that definitely has been the driving force for me uh, to, to advocate and to, to find time to volunteer and, and do everything I can towards, uh, you know, building peace. So I, I personally resonate uh, with that a lot. And thank you so much for bringing that up. I, I think that's very important, more important than anything. Uh, that desire in that heart, you know, heart desire for 
for for peace and for social justice. So just wanted to mention that. And thanks again for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Amina, the, and the, the young the young girls and women of Afghanistan, that is the one one of the big things they're always fighting for is have to be to education. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I just it just this this whole conversation just resonates so much with me. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yelena, I think I've seen you agreeing with things and probably maybe having some more comments, but yeah, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, um, you know, one of the things that I teach my preschoolers is really simple. It's like, peace begins with me. Peace begins with me. And, um, you know, I think that is what I'm trying to do on so many multiple levels um, as a mindfulness educator for teachers. It's that peace within, that peace begins with me is, you know, um, is an essential, I think that the first component, if we can get that in our teacher education programs, focusing on mindfulness and self first, and then build upon it. I think that is the first, uh, in, in my experience, in, in the experience that I'm seeing in schools and working with educators, that is, um, for me, the next, the next step is to really work on understanding self, on uh, cultivating care, on, um, you know, on building that resilience and well-being on knowing how to set boundaries. Um, so all of that, I think we are not, we are not teaching right now in our teacher education programs. And, um, you know, we are starting to teach kids this. So my preschoolers sometimes have better skills than adults that I'm dealing with. Um, and, you know, so that is, that is interesting, right? And, and my preschoolers are teaching their parents self-regulation skills. Uh, so, you know, so that's, I, I'm, you know, it is, it is intergenerational, like Paul is saying, um, you know, it needs, if, if our kids can teach adults, uh, that's great, but we also need to be really, really thinking about what are our priorities, where our resources go, and what do we want to practice? What do we want to practice? And how we want to practice. And peace is a practice. Peace is heart, mind, hands, and feet. <laughs> All of it. Yeah, yeah, I saw Paul put in the uh, chat uh, about the huge amount of military spending and how and that piece needs a budget and really that's what we're all asking for and saying that that needs to be in our consciousness um any other comments or questions before we wrap up i'll make a very quick comment mm -hmm. um the methodology that that we developed for assessing and accrediting peace professionals begins with self-learning in the sense that, that the candidate um, will first of all fill in a self-assessment on how they have put the values into practice in their own life and work. And we have found the feedback is that this is extraordinarily helpful and that many who have had many years of experience have not had to reflect on the self in context of their professionalism. So I just thought I'd add that. Thank you. Nancy, I want to comment something as well related to she, what Shilena has said. Uh, it is true that we have to start with a self. But I want to point the issue that that self depends also on the cultures. For mm -hmm. example, Chilena, and I'm sure it is the same case of the natives in North America, and of course in Canada. The self is the ours. 
I mean, it is very difficult in other cultures to work only on viewing, on going on your inside, because your own inside is our inside. So in a way that self is absolutely, uh, how can I say, mixed with the self of all the community. So uh, you have, and that is the, the magic of uh, peace education. One of the ma magic things is that how we have to really attach all the development of peace education to the culture where we are working. Because in this exercise of starting with the self, you're going to find that the self is really very plural. plural. So then all the exercise and the approaches have to change. And this shows what we have been saying during all this evening, that the flexibility and the, and the correspondence to the, the people that are going to develop these uh, skills and this knowledge and these values have to be absolutely related. So thank you for your reflection on the self remembering that the self is something that it is not individual only yeah well i, I want to thank all our presenters and all uh, everybody who was on the call this was a really good call i i mean we're all so interconnected and um i think that's what peace education mm -hmm. is showing us and i i really appreciate all your comments and presentations um want to turn it over to Kendra to um, just let us know when the next call is and to give our final quote. And uh, if our presenters could stay on for a couple minutes, that would be great. But thank you all so much um, for being part of this. I join in thanking everybody. And our next call will be on Wednesday, July 19th. It's the third Wednesday, and it starts at the same time, wherever you are, 6 p.m. or 9 p.m., um, or in points in between or outside of those range. Mm -hmm. The closing quote, um, I picked Malala Yousafzai, you must fight others, but through peace and through dialogue and through education. Thank you all. Thank you.